right? Yeah, we, we have some food. So, for today, I want to share a message about family, God and family altar. Um, this week, starting last Sabbath, according to the church calendar, is uh, family togetherness emphasis week, right? It's a week where we emphasize being together as families. I shared this message at Waipahu Church last Sabbath, and uh, I want to share it here as well as we promote family togetherness. Right. Let me pray one more time, and we'll get into our message. Father in heaven, uh, today we come to you once again, uh, inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Starting with me, as a speaker, Lord, I need your help. I need the Holy Spirit to speak through me. Let your message come alive, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. May we understand your word and learn something new today that we can apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. All right, we'll focus on God and family altar today in our message. If you have seen birds fly, I'm sure you have uh, seen some types of birds that would fly in different shapes. And one of a very common shape is the shape of a V, right? And according to scientists, this is important to help uh, birds to be able to fly long distance. The birds in the front of the shape are the ones that have to face the strongest resistance against the wind, apparently. And by, sh by forming the shape, uh, it creates an area of the formation where the, the resistance from the wind is a little bit softer, in a sense, because of the shape. And so, according to scientists, they discovered that as birds fly, uh, some types of, uh, quite a number of birds, actually, fly in this shape, uh, after a while, the ones in the front get tired and weak, and so they can switch their formation, uh, their location, by going to the back. And so the ones that have rested a bit in the softer resistance area comes to the front. And in that sense, the older birds oftentimes fly in the back and giving them an easier uh, area to fly with it. And then the younger birds, right, with the stronger energy, with more energy, can fly in the front. With this formation and then moving in their location back and forth, back and forth, they're able to fly much, much further than they would be able to if they were to fly alone. There's definitely blessing in working as a family. Being together as a family can take you much, much further than you would be able to go alone. So, we all need families. We all need a team of individuals who supports us, who love us. We need to be surrounded by an environment of, with people who has the best intention for all of us, for each of our lives. So the question is, right, for, for what about for those that no longer have parents or immediate families? I believe this is where the church family can come into uh, the place, right? We're not perfect. We make mistakes. But it's important for us to care for one another. Right. Yep. All right, so in a recent survey of Seventh-day Adventist families around the world by the General Conference, they find out that only 52% of Seventh-day Adventists have personal worship on a daily basis. More troubling yet, only 37% of our Adventist families have worship in the home. This means that about 63% of all Adventist homes do not have family worship. Which means we come to church once a day during the week and that's, that's all we get to be exposed to spiritual environment without worship in the home. Children grow up uh, without family worship, without being surrounded by spiritual environment. That's a large percentage. Right? According to Psalm, David wrote this, right? Psalm 43, verse 3 to 4. David said, Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go 
to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, God, O oh my God. Right? So why did David mention this idea of the holy hill and the tabernacle and an altar? If we look at the Old Testament times, God instituted a system of sacrifice and a system of worship where they would bring their sacrificial animals and sacrifice them on the altar at the temple, at the tabernacle, and it would be a form of worshiping God. It would be a form of sacrifice and surrendering to God. So when David is saying, I will go to the altar of God, he's pointing out this idea that we go to sacrifice to God, we go to worship God as we sacrifice our um, sacrificial offerings. But we no longer need to kill animals today. As we all know, we come to church without bringing lambs or goats or birds. <laughs> we come to worship God in person. Now the question is, as we come to worship God here in the church, where is the altar? Right? Where is the altar that we bring our sacrifice to? Is the altar limited to just the temple? Is the altar limited to just um, a specific location inside the church? I believe not, right? In the New Testament system that God instituted through Jesus Christ, the very interesting thing happened when Jesus died on the cross. The curtain in the temple in Jerusalem was torn from top to bottom, meaning the actual physical altar uh, sacrifice system, sacrificial system in the altar was no longer needed. And then in the New Testament, we are called a priesthood of all believers. And in Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So we become living temples which means the altar of God is everywhere we go. So what do we sacrifice then? What do we bring to sacrifice? We'll talk more about that. And um, I want us to look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20 to 39. And here, we're not going to read everything, right? Connie, could you kindly increase the zoom because this is a little bit small on the screen, so thank you. All right, the battle of the gods. We mentioned briefly about this during our Sabbath school lesson. This, this is where we would find a God bringing back the altar, right? the altar of worship to the true God. Here in this story, we find that um, Elijah the prophet was challenged uh, by the prophets of Baal, the false gods, uh, to, uh, to see who is the true God. Who is the true God? At that time, the king was King Ahab. He was considered one of the worst kings of Israel. He disobeyed God, and he married a pagan princess, Jezebel. He started serving and worshiping Baal. And so the children of Israel, in, as a result, accepted poor direction and influences and forgot to worship Yahweh, the true God. The God of Moses, the God of Israel, the one true God instructed them to love God with all their heart, soul, and strength. But they started worshiping Baal and other gods and goddesses. They abandoned their worship of the true God. Elijah was commanded by God to go meet Ahab and challenge, right? Challenge the false gods. Now imagine this, on that hill, on Mount Carmel, all the priests of Baal were coming. And King Ahab himself came, probably dressed in his kingly attire, wearing fancy clothes. All the priests of Baal dressed properly, arriving, King Ahab with his royal robes, his prophets, and the children of Israel who were there to observe. Who is the true God? Right. Now, Elijah, standing before them, calls the children of Israel to come closer. Right. Now they built altars. Now this is where we find this idea of altar and sacrifice once again. The contest was simple. The prophets of Baal would build an altar for their God, 
and Elijah would make one for the God of Israel, Yahweh. It would be a battle between the two gods, or the false gods and the one true God. Elijah, Yahweh's prophet, and the priest of Baal would cut up a bull for sacrifice on each altar, but not put fire on it. They were not allowed to light the fire themselves. The contest was that they would rely on their gods to bring down fire, to send down fire. The altar that got fired up first would be the winner, and that God would be the God of the people, the children of Israel. After six hours of, right, according to, if you read, if you read uh, verse 29, right, they cried for pretty much half the day, from noon to evening. It's like six hours. <laughs> six hours of crying and pleading to their god Baal. By the prophets of Baal, there was no fire at all, despite the uproar, right? If you read verse 29, the Bible says, there was no voice, no answer, and no response. Now it was the turn for Elijah. He rebuilt the altar of the Lord. Apparently, it had been torn down for some time because the children of Israel stopped worshiping God. And so Elijah rebuilt, taking 12 stones as a symbol for 12 tribes of Israel. Then he dug a trench around it. After arranging the wood and the pieces of the bowl, he had four jars of water. <laughs> poured over the altar three times, soaking everything completely wet so that no one can say that Elijah lighted the fire himself. Imagine, the altar of God was completely wet. There was, it was impossible for Elijah to light the fire. So if God were to come through, it would be a miracle for them, for the people to witness that it was truly from God. Then Elijah prayed, O oh Lord, right, look at this in verse 36 and 37, right? We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 18, right? Verse 36 and 37. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that this people may know you, O oh Lord, our God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Right? Elijah was pleading with God for God to come through, to show himself as the one true God. Amen. Cosmic drama. Right. This was not just a, a, like a, an earthly battle between two systems of worship. This was a battle at a cosmic level of what we often call the great controversy. Behind the scene is Satan working through different agencies and pretending to be God and the one true God battling. Right. You know, before continuing on with the story, even today, like the children of Israel, many of us are being distracted, being led away from God. Our families are no longer having family worship. Just as the children of Israel turned away from the true altar, if we no longer have family worship, personal worship services, personal devotions in our lives, it's as if we're just like the children of Israel who have turned away. We're distracted, right? So many distractions Satan is using to distract us. Television, right? TV, social media, the internet, smartphones, and other devices. They have consumed much of our time, our family's time, attention, and maybe even our affections, right? The impact of the internet in our day and age have damaging effects on our mental health, social skills, memory, self-image. It has powerful influence in our homes. According to recent study that I read, they said that teenagers nowadays, probably even adults too, spend at least eight hours a day on screens, watching TV, watching YouTube, looking at different things on the internet. Eight hours a day, friends. That's average, right? 
eight hours a day. Granted, it's not all bad. Some things that our children are using the internet for are good things for educational purposes, learning more about the world and God, and right? it can be a good thing. But I would guess that majority of the time, most of our children are just watching things that do not have anything to do with God. Right? Being influenced by what we see. It may look like it's, you know, it's not that important. You know, my child is just watching something on YouTube. It's, it, it cannot be that harmful, right? The seemingly little tiny things can actually lead to larger destruction in our homes. If we do not have family worship intentional time to build altar in our homes once again. We'll just be like the children of Israel who have discarded, who have moved away from the altar. Right? The truth is, even today, just like the children of Israel, we spend more time with false gods. Right? If that is the case, we, it will be harder for us to really know the voice of God if we're bombarded with you know, daily uh, information just from the world. If we do not set intentional time to spend time with God. Right, there was an old saying with uh, uh, this, this idea of we are what we eat. <laughs> In a similar way, you know, we can say we are what we see. We are what we hear. We are what we put into our minds. There is this phrase, uh, this, this, uh, this acronym. I don't know if you've heard of it. GIGO. G-I-G-O, Gigo. What is that? Simply stands for garbage in, garbage out. If you take garbage in, you will not be able to produce anything good. Right? And, and that is the reason why I believe Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 invites Christians to say, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done well, to stand. We need to have protection, right? We need to have protections. So, when we study God's Word every day and pray for His protection over our families, in a sense, we are building family altar in our homes. You may say, well, my children have left. It's just me and my wife. It's just me and my spouse. It's just me and my husband. Pray together, morning, evening, as husband and wives. Build family altar. When we study God's Word daily and pray for His protection over our families, our children who are far and near, we're claiming Jesus' victory over Satan. We're choosing good over evil. As we spend time God, with, with God intentionally, our hearts would be transformed right? and ready to hear God's voice. I mean, think about this, right? If, 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 you, if you wake up in the morning and then you don't spend time to read God's Word and you're just watching the news and then you go on about, you know, with, with your day, um, you're going to hear so many voices. Voices from your friends, your parents, the concerns of your boss, people in the community, the problems of the world and our society. How would you hear the voice of God in that context? We need to set aside time. When we pray for a hedge of protection around our family, right, God sends His angels to protect our families from the evil forces. So, will you choose to be on God's side right, or somewhere else in the middle, perhaps, like the children of Israel sitting on the fence? Right? We all know the story of how it turns out for Elijah on Mount Carmel. Everything was soaking wet. And yet, after the prayer of Elijah, God sent down His fire to consume the sacrifice on the true altar. Right? Now, you may think that, okay, that's it, right? What can, what can I learn from this story? Well, there's so much to learn. In Child's Guidance, page 518, Ellen White wrote this, Like the pages of all, those who profess to love God should erect an altar to the Lord wherever they pitch their tent. What does it mean? <laughs> wherever you live, wherever your home is, wherever you're with your family, build an altar. Build an altar to the Lord. 
Fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication for themselves and for their children. In such a household, Jesus will love to tarry. In such a family where family altars are built, Jesus will dwell with the family, with the children. Right? Beautiful. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 said, The Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. Right? It's like some of us wonder, like, how, how can I know what to speak, what to share? Well, uh, the promise of God is that God will let you know how to talk, how to speak, how to share about Him. And then there's this beautiful text in Isaiah. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. When you wake up in the morning, it's as if God has wakened you up to hear Him speak. <laughs> What's the first thing you look at when you wake up in the morning? What's the first thing you read? What's the first thing you focus your attention to when you wake up in the morning? I want to appeal to you, friends, right? Church family today, when you wake up in the morning, when I wake up in the morning, let's make it a habit to turn our attention first and foremost to God, to hear what He has to tell us, right? He wakens me, my ear, to hear Him, right? The temptation is we look at our phone, right? It's the first thing we watch. <laughs> probably YouTube, the news. Why not set aside a time for God? Okay. Councils on Health, page 163. Helen White wrote, All who are under the training of God need the quiet hour for communion with their own hearts and with nature and with God. Okay. We must individually hear Him speaking to the heart when every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before Him. And the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. And He bids us, be still and know that I am God. Beautiful, right? We all need individual quiet hour with God. I want to challenge you, friends, right, to, to, to set aside some time, to just go walk in nature one day, right? If you have some time off in the afternoon, just go somewhere on the beach, probably just bring your Bible, just spend some time alone with God. When was the last time, really, when was the last time you took an intentional, quiet hour with God? Just bring your Bible, go somewhere, read the story of Jesus. Just you and God, turn off your phones. Right? You know, I, I, I have to put my phone on do not disturb mode, like every now and then throughout the days. Like, especially when I'm trying to do my devotion. Because I would get a notification on my phone, a text message from this, ding! Ding, 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 email notification from the conference, from the school, right? It's like all over. And we get distracted so easily, even when we're trying to spend some time with God. But it needs to be guarded. Amen. It needs to be a quiet hour alone with God. Do not let anything disturb that time alone with God. You need it, friend. I need it. That's the only way we can attune, we can tune our hearts and minds to hear the voice of God loud and clear. In order for God's voice to be loud and clear, every other voice needs to be silenced. Right? We need it. One of our professors at the seminary in Andrews University did not allow the students, all of us, to not, he did not allow us to use any electronic devices at all. You know, in college, most teachers would allow us to take notes on our computer, right? But this professor, he said, I'm not allowing any one of you to use any electronic devices. You have to take down notes by hand. Why do you have to be so strict? He said, when you see a single notification on your computer screen or on your phone, like ding, 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 or something like uh, slides in, it distracts your attention. And he said, it takes at least about 10 more minutes or 20 more minutes to bring your attention fully back to the topic. Right? When you're reading the Bible, when you're studying the Sabbath school lesson, when you're trying to spend some time with God and then you get a notification, you no longer have full attention on what you're trying to read. Right? It would take at least 10 or 20 more minutes to bring back that attention to God. So friends, we need to guard that time with God, that altar, right? that altar of sacrifice. 
So in a sense, we no longer bring sacrificial animals to God nowadays. But what do we sacrifice to God? We can bring ourselves, our time as a sacrifice. Right? Just like the children of Israel would bring an animal to the altar. You say, God, today I'm bringing 20 minutes in the morning as my sacrificial lamb. <laughs> right? Bring your time to God. Sacrifice to God. It's beautiful. Right? Look at this. She continues to write, Amidst the hurrying throngs of the strain and the strain of life intense activities, he who is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. He will receive a new endowment of both physical and mental strength. Amen. Imagine this, if you spend time with God alone, refreshed and renewed with new energies, to know that God loves you and you are protected, even when everything around you is falling apart, you will have peace. That's something the world cannot give. When you're filled with worries, what's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to my family? You would be filled with peace if you spend time with God and know that He's going to take care of you. You may ask, Pastor, why, why, why connect the story of Elijah to this? Well, the reason being this, the story of Elijah and Mount Carmel, of how God came through to show His power, is not just for that time period. It's interesting that when we look at Malachi chapter 5, verse 5 to 6, this is the last book of the Old Testament, just before Jesus came to uh, the seed, right, on earth. <laughs> Malachi said, right, this is God speaking, right? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the, heart, the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Huh. We can apply this to the first coming of Jesus, right? There was, the, there was prophet Elijah in the form of uh, John the Baptist. Right? He was like crying in the, 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 the wilderness. But because this is the, the great and awesome day, in other translation, the great and terrible day of the Lord, right? I believe we can apply this to the second coming of Jesus. Before the second coming of Jesus, God is going to bring up a generation of Elijah's fathers who are turning their, the hearts of their children back to God. The message of Elijah is turning the hearts of the fathers to their children, the children, to their fathers. This is a message of family coming together. So I believe before Jesus comes again in the last days, God wants a generation of fathers and children and family coming together to turn their hearts to God, building family altars, altars of sacrifice for God, just as Elijah built an altar on Mount Carmel. God wants to do that, right? So, what, what's a practical way that a father can build that family altar environment in the home, other than family worship, right? I found this quote to be very practical, right? This quote says, the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Amen. Right? We're starting man's ministry. I believe this is practical, right? Fathers, love your wives. Amen. Love your wives for your children's sake. They're watching. They're seeing. Children learn best from examples, right? Oftentimes, I've, I've heard some parents say, to tell their children, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do as I do, you know, like, do as I say, not as I, not as I do, you know. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work that way. We need to set example for our children, right? Fathers, love your wives. Love the mother of your children. That's the best thing you can do for your children. Amen. They will see that as you care for their mothers, that you're setting good examples for them, right? And this, this makes sense, right? This makes sense. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, we read this earlier. The Bible instructs parents, right? Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he would not depart from it. Train up children in the way they should go. Have worship in the home. Build family altar with their children. Sing songs to God together. Pray to God together. You know, what does it mean when the Bible says that they will not depart from it? When we see that even godly parents sometimes have children who walked away from faith. 
what, what does it mean, right? Did it mean that the parents did not do a great job? Well, I think we live in a broken world where there's so many temptations of the world that even when a parent, you know, even when parents did the best they could, there are scenarios where children still walk away from God. Well, at the end of the day, every child have their own freedom, their free will to choose, right? You cannot force your child. But still, I believe what this text is trying to teach us is that if you train your child to enjoy, you know, a worship environment, a family altar, worshiping God together, if your child grows up in that environment, even if he grows up, even if he walks away, he will not forget. He will not forget the experience that he had or she had growing up. Right? It's kind of like this, right? I, I grew up with my mother's cooking and I loved my mother's food. Right? And even when I moved away, moved out of the house, as I, as I grew up, I never forget the taste of my mother's cooking. <laughs> I long for it, right? In a sense, even if your children walk away, they will remember the taste of the presence of God. Now, I want to encourage you. If your child is no longer walking in the way of the Lord, don't give up. Don't ever, ever give up. Keep on praying for them. Keep on praying for them. Keep on loving them, right? The prayers of the parents will reach far. Don't ever, ever give up. I really like this sermon done by Pastor Dwight Nelson. One time he mentioned about this, right? You know, to, to those parents, he said, to those parents whose children have walked away from the faith, he said, you know, don't ever give up. Pray. God understands. The reason being, if there is anyone who understands the pain of having a child who walked away, it would be God. Because the whole story of, you know, this problem of evil and sin started with Lucifer when he walked away from God. He was a beloved child of God in the beginning. God never intended Lucifer to walk away, and yet Lucifer did. The lesson is God understands whatever your family situation is. Either your child is still with you or have walked away or have moved to some other place. Whatever the scenario is, Built, and fam built a family altar anyway. If you read the story of Job, right? In the book of Job, we find that Job prayed every day, morning and evening, and when he sacrificed to God, his prayer included a prayer asking God for forgiveness of the, the, the sins of his children. He said he even sacrificed and said, you know, uh, sacrifice, and in this prayer, just in case, if my children committed sins that they did not know. That's a beautiful system of sacrifice, right? Altar, right? So, fathers, love your wives, love your children. Wives, love your husbands, love your children. Let's build a healthy family in each of our homes. Then it will reflect in our church. And it will be a shining light example, a beacon of light that the community can observe. It has to start with you and me individually, in our homes, in our families. So I want to appeal each of us to be intentional about this. If you don't have a set aside time to worship God alone, please do it. Please pick a time that is best for you. It could be either in the morning or in the evening. Pick the best time for you, right? If you're not a morning person, set aside some time in the evening, right? But by all means, have a time alone with God. It starts with you. It starts with me. Right? As we individually worship God alone. And as we build family altars in our homes, intentional family altars where the children, parents come together to sing songs, to pray together. Right? We're creating healthy spiritual environment for our children to grow up in. And as we come together as a church family, it's going to reflect. It will be wonderful to be together, right? I want to end my sermon with this story of Rabbi Yitzhak Halevi Herzog, a Jewish rabbi, and how he saved plenty of Jewish children, right? According to the story, during World War II, 
Hitler and the Nazi Germany was tearing families apart, Jewish families apart, all over Europe. They captured many Jewish families, brought their parents, right, separated the parents from the children, worked, their, worked them till they're dead in concentration camps. Right. The children were gone. Many times the children were even killed in the process. As a result of this, <coughs> During the, the, the course of the war, many parents gave up their children for adoption so that their children would not have to die. So many of Jewish children were given up to adoption agencies all over Europe, Christian charities, Christian orphanages, and non-Christians alike all over Europe. There were thousands and thousands of Jewish children that were lost from their parents. Many of the parents died, some survived, right? And this Jewish rabbi, right, religious leader, Rabbi Herzog, had an idea. After the war ended, he wanted to rebuild a Jewish community, Jewish communities all over Europe. So he traveled to orphanages, and he asked, you know, the orphanage directors, or the wardens, the caretakers, I want to thank you for taking care of Jewish children during this war. But now that the war is over, we want to bring back our Jewish children home. We want to create our own Jewish community once again. Can you allow us to take our Jewish children home? <laughs> Oftentimes, the caretakers and the orphanages would say, oh, but we no longer know which one is a Jewish child. We can no longer distinguish a Jewish child from a Christian child or you know, a non-Jewish child. They're all the same to us now. It's been a few years of war. We don't know. We don't have any records left. Rabbi Herzog would say, no problem. No problem. I know what to do. So what did he do? He sang a song, a song called Shema. Apparently, Jewish family were taught to sing these prayer songs in their family worship every day. And this was what he sang. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Right? It's from uh, the, 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 the writing of Moses, the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. As he sang that prayer song that every Jewish family regularly sing every day in their family worship time, as he sang that song in the orphanage, after a while, like immediately rather, dozens of children rush to the stage, rush to the rabbi, crying out, Papa, Mama, Mama, Papa. Why? Apparently, few, even though few of the children probably remember their early life's experiences as children, the sound of the Biblical song of Shema, the most famous prayer in the Jewish family, instantly brought back memories for those very, very young children. Imagine that, reciting those Hebrew words with their parents before bedtime brought back their memories of their parents. As soon as the rabbi sang, all the Jewish children came together. He brought them out. He visited orphanage after orphanages all throughout Europe, and he was able to save many, many Jewish children. Some say about 500, some say over 1,000 Jewish children just by singing a prayer song from the Bible. Right? Now, that's, that goes to show the power of family worship. You may think that your children will not remember. They will. They will remember. They will remember. And one day when God calls them with the voice, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, knocking on the doors of their hearts, right. they would return. They would say, Papa, Mama, my Father. They would be able to God, call, their, call God as their father. So it is my prayer that each of us, individually, families, 
would come together, spend time alone with God, build family altars in our homes, teach our children to grow up, train them to love God, continue to pray, never ever give up, right? never ever give up. Let us pray. Father in heaven, today we come together as church family on this family togetherness emphasis Sabbath. We sacrifice our time to you. We sacrifice our hearts, ourselves to you, as Paul invites us in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I beseech you, brethren, to offer yourself as living sacrifices. Lord, it is our prayer today that each of us would individually build altar, personal worship time to God. And each of our families would intentionally have family worship time, building family altars in our homes, creating an environment of worship. It is sad that, Lord, majority of Adventist Christian families are no longer having family worship today. May we change that one family at a time, one person at a time. Lord, may it start with me. May it start with me as the pastor. May I be more intentional in my personal time with God. Lord, may it start with our elders, our deacons, deaconesses, every department leaders and every single members. May it start with individuals to have a desire to spend time with you alone in the quietness where every other voice is silenced. May we experience your presence closer and closer. And may we do that with families. And may we come together as church families, strengthened by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Bless us today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.